Matt, and thanks for the invite. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Drew Webster, and I work for Anne Arundel County's Cultural Resources Section. We're part of the Office of Planning and Zoning. And I also do work with the Lost Towns Project nonprofit. And I see some familiar faces um, from volunteers in the audience and plenty of new folks, too. So hello to everyone. Um, <clears throat> Matt invited me to talk about the Native American archaeology in Anne Arundel County uh, in observance of Native American Heritage Month, which is November. Uh, we recently developed an online tool, a website that talks a lot about um, Native American archaeology in the county, specifically focused at um, Jug Bay Wetlands Sanctuary, which I'll, which I'll talk about. Um, we worked with the um, this started as a partnership with the county school system. We were talking with the social studies teachers and, and they were looking for some more resources on local history. And we asked what sort of topics they wanted more on. And they didn't have much on native history and really nothing on, on archaeology going, you know, going back thousands of years. Um, and we, our office has done a lot of work there. A lot of this caveat has been before I, before I started. Um, I think we've been excavating in Jug Bay for around 15 years. Um, I've been with the county for five. So uh, some of this that I'll be talking about happened before I got there. Um, but I'll do my best to answer any questions. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And I believe that um, Matt's putting some links in the chat, which is which is great. So you can, uh, this is, uh, I'll be scrolling through um, this story map and it's public. So uh, everyone can access it and explore it on your own time. There's lots of links in there um, that I won't be clicking on, but that, that link to all sorts of other resources uh, on native history and archeology. span Let me share my screen. Okay, hopefully you all see what I'm seeing. Looks good from here. Thanks. <clears throat> so this is what we came up with. It's it's designed for teachers and, and uh, middle school, high school students, but I, honestly, it's just good for anyone um, to, to learn about local heritage. I'll be talking about Anne Arundel County, um, but a lot of this is gonna be true for much of the counties on the Western shore um as far as tribal affiliation and cultural periods um at its broadest it's it's the same as um really most of the east coast some of the specifics will, will be more central maryland um and i will highlight now that at the end we have a, a really nice additional resources section um including educator resources and other websites on Maryland Native history. So if you're not from Anne Arundel County and you want to see what's out there, these might have some um, some leads for you. So we've structured this uh, in, in the kind of three main cultural periods that archaeologists use to describe um, Native history. Um, and, we, and then we talk about the Jug Bay complex, which I'll be using as examples. Um, the story continues is a section on uh, contact period colonialism um, and kind of where Maryland's native tribes are today. Um, and then some people wanted a section on archaeology 101. What is it? How do we know what we know? And I, I don't need to explain that to you all, but it's, it's there for um, teachers or students or anyone uh, interested. But the main goals is to, to show how Maryland's native people have adapted over the last 13,000 plus years, um, linking kind of cultural patterns to changes in the environment, um, learning how artifacts, traditions, foodways, and languages have changed, um, learn about the four major periods that archaeologists divide uh, native history into understand archaeology and uh, not stop the story at 1600, a little bit about where 
tribes are today and some links to more about tribal histories. <clears throat> I do want to also say that obviously I am an archaeologist. I am also not a member of a Native American tribe. And so this is one perspective on uh, learning the past. This is what archaeology is, is showing. Um, there are many other great perspectives out there. And honestly, as far as contact period and, and the more recent history, the last 400, 500 years, at least in Anne Arundel County, we don't have a lot archaeologically. So we have some written record, um, but the, the tribal histories themselves um, are often the best for that time period. So I will be focusing kind of on the, the deep past, um, but that's only because that's what archaeology lends itself to um, more so than the more recent past where it's really, we just don't have um, any contact sites that we've definitively identified in the county. <clears throat> okay, where are we? Here's Anne Arundel County, um, in case you don't know. <clears throat> The important things that we'll be mentioning geographic features of Anne Arundel and most of Maryland is the Chesapeake Bay uh, and the Patuxent River are our eastern and western borders. There are also native names. Uh, and that's all a lot also where we find a lot of Native American sites is on those bodies of water <clears throat> for obvious reasons. Um Another question I get a lot is kind of tribal affiliation. Who's, whose stuff is this? That can get really hard when you're going back thousands of years, but at least the last 1,000, 1,300 or so would be the ancestors of um, the modern Piscataway people. Um, we also had historically um, groups that are, some some of them are, are still here with these names. Some of these groups kind of merged or left the area. Um, but historically, we know that in the county we had Piscataway, Patuxent, Mattapaniant, Acostian, and Susquehannock people kind of coming and going. A little bit about native language, which I won't go into because it isn't my expertise, but some links on oral history um, and the Algonquin language. Many of these um, tribal groups that I mentioned are um, Algonquin peoples, the Piscataway, Patuxent, Mattapanian. Um, they're focused in, in kind of present day Southern Anne Arundel, Prince George's, Charles Calvert and St. Mary's County. So kind of Southern Maryland. Um, the Susqua, and, and they're, they're still around today and um, kind of centered in, in Charles County. <clears throat> to the North at, at time of contact, we had Susquehannocks um, up kind of up by where Natural History Museum is, um, up in Baltimore, north of that, going up into Pennsylvania. Anne Arundel was an interesting case because at the time of contact, we don't have um, evidence for more than a couple of villages um, that were documented in South County. It seems like it was um, still being used seasonally for hunting, but there weren't permanent villages in, in like, at least in the central part of the northern part of the county. Uh, it was kind of a between the Algonquin speaking uh, tribes to the south and the Susquehannocks who are Iroquoian speaking to the, to the north. A little bit about archaeology. Um, and, and archaeological sites in the county. Maryland has, I don't even, I don't know the total number. It has to be over 10,000 archaeological sites. Um, and we're finding new ones every day. We just hit 1750 in Anne Arundel County. I like to brag that that's the most of any county, but that doesn't actually mean that we have the most archaeological sites. It just means that we've recorded the most archaeological sites. Anywhere that there were people, uh, as you know, th there are going to be archaeological sites. Um, and Anne Arundel County has had a, a long um, history of, of archaeology at the county level and, and at the nonprofit level. Plus, there's been tons of development, which can lead to archaeological studies. <clears throat> I'll be talking about kind of four main cultural periods in Native history. And this is how archaeologists divide um, kind of pre-contact history. There's the Paleo-Indian period, which goes from about 13,000, 13 and a half thousand years ago to 11 and a half thousand years ago. And 
honestly probably earlier, but that's where the agreement's at right now. Um, the archaic period, which lasted from 11,500 to 3,000 years ago, uh, and the woodland period, which was 3,000 years ago to European contact 400 years ago, and then contact and post-contact period. Uh, and those are based on um, changes in environment and especially changes in, in artifacts. Um, and we'll go, we'll see that as we go along. So each of these sections starts with the environment because it's important to understand. Um, the Paleo-Indian environment was very different than today. Again, this is 11 to 13,000 years ago. Some of the first peoples who we know for sure were in Maryland. Um, this was the end of the last ice age. So everything was a, obviously a lot colder to then than it, than it is now. Maryland looked a lot more like Atlantic Canada than, than the mid-Atlantic. Um, a lot more spruce and pine, conifers, less deciduous trees. Um, colder and wetter weather. An interesting thing is the Chesapeake Bay didn't exist yet in its current form. Um, it was just the Susquehanna River at that point. The Chesapeake Bay now is the kind of flooded floodplain of, of the Susquehanna River. Um, what that means is there would have been Paleo-Indian sites up and down the Susquehanna River, um, but all of those would be underwater now. So we don't have Paleo-Indian sites necessarily near the next to the bay, because the bay wasn't around. So if it was, if it's today next to the bay, it was miles and miles inland. Where we do find a lot of Paleo-Indian sites are along the Patuxent, the Patapsco, some of the other major rivers that haven't changed as much the way the bay has. I want to give a shout out to one of our volunteers whose name is Barry Gay, who does wonderful artistic reproductions um, of uh, artifacts, archaeological sites, um, and, and cultural periods. And so if you see these sort of orange ochre colored drawings in here, um, they were all done by Barry. He's been at several digs um, with us in the county, and I think they're fabulous. He takes artifacts and then kind of makes a reconstruction. Um, of, of what that might look like. So after environment, we go into social structure. Um, this is contentious still in the scientific community, um, but uh, we at least agree that the first Native Americans were here at least 13 to 13 and a half thousand years ago. Um, archaeologists call these people Paleo-Indians. It's quite possible and looking more and more likely like people were here before that. We do have a few kind of pre-Clovis sites um, in Maryland. Um, people are still fighting about it. <clears throat> I, I feel like more and more evidence is going to come out and it's that date's going to get pushed back. But for now, we'll say 13,000 years, um, either across um, the land bridge, across the Bering Strait, or along the coast following that land, following game, um, and moving very quickly kind of throughout the continent. That's the most widely accepted theory. <clears throat> Rivers were very important um, for transportation. <clears throat> and we know that uh, in the Paleo-Indian period, people were hunting and fishing, gathering seeds, nuts, fruits, and berries. And we can find some of the record of this in the archeological record. Um, they're traveling together in small bands. We don't have villages yet. Um, and the, the human population too was a lot smaller than it is today. If you think about the, the cold climate, that means that there's going to be fewer food resources than we have now. And so that means that it can support a only a smaller human population. Uh, artifacts from the Paleo period are hard to find because the sites are hard to find because there were, um, it was a lower population. They were nomadic, so they're not leaving uh, kind of a, a, the same mark that a village would leave on a, on a landscape. Um, and then, as I mentioned, a lot of it's going to be under the bay now. Um, most of what we find are really just spear points. We don't have ground stone tools yet. We don't have pottery yet. Um, the most common, uh, not the most common, but the most famous kind of point is a Clovis point. Let's see if this goes. Now we do have some Clovis points later in here. 
one thing we're working on for this um, toolbox, now that I did that, I'll never get back. Mm, sorry, one second. Sorry about this, it is not liking me. Yes, Smithsonian, I love you. No, I'm not gonna support you right now. You angered the, the paywall. I, I've angered the paywall. All right, come on. Let me, hmm. <laughs> sorry about this, one moment. The joys of Zoom. Oh, phew, finally got out of that, jeez. Thought it was never gonna end. All right, I'm gonna try to share again. Apologies for that. It's all good, no worries. Do, do, do. Take two, I won't click on links this time. <clears throat> One thing that we're, what we're um, working on is using photogrammetry to create 3D models of artifacts. Um, and then we're going to embed them in here. So we have a model of the Clovis point. It's not ready to go up yet. Um, we had a, a former intern we were able to hire on as a photogrammetry tech to kind of create these models. Photogrammetry is where you take like 100 pictures of an object from every different angle, and then you use a computer program to stitch them together, and you're left with kind of a 3D model. Um, you could use it for 3D printing, but you also it's also just really good for something like this because it you can manipulate it, you can move it around, you can zoom in, you can kind of see the flaking on some of the projectile points. Um, and so I have one in here as, as, a, as a test, but we're still working on getting that up. But the plan is to add them here and we'll have a separate um, landing page for that too. I'm really excited because only so many people can come to the lab and see them. So I want them to get out there. The archaic period is next. Um, and again, that's about 3,000 to 10,000 years ago, it, no, 11. Um, it's warmer. Uh, the The environment starts to look more like it does today. Um, the ice has melted. The Chesapeake Bay is formed, begins to form in the early archaic period from the drainage of the Susquehanna River. Um, increased temperature means increased food for Native Americans, and so the population increases, which means that more archaeological sites are able to be found. Um, so we have more artifacts from the Archaic period than from the Paleo period. Um, population grows during this time. Um, we still don't have villages that'll be in the woodland period. Um, People are hunting and gathering in small groups, traveling between food resources. Over those several thousand years, people start um, traveling a little less and focusing in on a smaller range. Um, and we especially find archaic sites along the bay, um, streams, uh, and inland swamps like Zakaya Swamp um, down in, in Southern Maryland. We know from archaeological sites in Maryland that in the in the archaic period, Native Americans were eating a wider variety of food resources because more are, are now available now that the climate is warmer. So we have archaeological evidence of deer, bear, turkey, rabbit, squirrel, and turtle, hickory nut, butternut, acorn, um, and some other nut seeds and fruits. Um, rivers and marshlands continue to be really important. So things like oysters, fish, and crabs. Um, we do find a lot of sites near rivers and marshes. The hot new thing in the archaic period was ground stone tools. So a, as opposed to a, a flaked stone tool, a, a, an arrowhead or a projectile point is a flake stone tool, um, meaning it's formed by hitting a rock with a harder rock until flakes come off of it. A ground stone tool 
is made by carving a rock with a harder rock. Um, and so in the Paleo period, we really only have flaked stuff. Um, we don't see stone axes and other kind of ground stones the way we do in, in the Archaic. But by the Archaic, we start seeing um, stone axes, mortars and pestles, um, things like that. And so we're also, that, that gives us clues about how people are interacting with the environment. We know people can are chopping down trees, they're grinding up those nuts and acorns um, with the mortar and pestle. <clears throat> they're heavier too, so you don't want to be carrying them as long. One thing that archaeologists like to look at is, uh, and and the first thing, if any of you have volunteered in a lab, that you'll do when you when you identify something is figure out what it's made out of, um, and that can tell us a few things. So, in Anne Arundel County, um, quartz and quartzite you can find locally, and we find lots and lots of points made from quartz and quartzite. But it's not the best material to make points out of. The crystalline structure of the rock is a little unpredictable, so when you hit it with a hammer stone to flake it, um, you're not going to have as much control as with other uh, types of stones. Um, so we do find other stones. Um, rhyolite and jasper are two big ones. Um, the Clovis point here is jasper. Uh, and do we have rhyolite? This, this Hopewell point is rhyolite. Um, those are better to make points out of. They're more predictable. Um, you'll often, when you look at the points that are made of those materials, they often look like they're higher quality because people were able to um, make finer details on them with the way the structure of the rock is. Um, but we don't have that here in the uh, lower western shore. Um, Rhyolite comes from Catoctin Mountains of Western Maryland, so Frederick area. Jasper comes from southeastern Pennsylvania and far northeast um, Maryland. Those are the, the closest sources to, to central Maryland. Um, and so we we know and we can tell that people are traveling and trading for for these because we get things made out of all sorts of stones, um, but there aren't any known sources in this area. Interestingly, we find that over time, they're they're kind of preferring more quartz and quartzite and less of these exotic materials as we call them which oh, i always get a kick out of exotic all the way from frederick in pennsylvania um i think that might have to do with the fact that over time the population's increasing and so people are traveling in, in smaller groups here we go here's one of the models i'm going to try to do it and not break everything so we're going to be adding in um some artifact highlights like this. Um, this is a, a Jasper Palmer point and you can spin it around and you can see the bands in it. I think it's the coolest thing. She showed me, Emily Lucy is our um, tech who did all this. Um, she is wonderful and she showed me how to do it. It is a lot of patience to sit there with a turntable and take hundreds of pictures of something. Um, I think it's really cool. So this this residue is because this is from a, a, a private collection and he had kind of glued it onto particle board. So th that's what the white is from. Um, wouldn't have been there originally. So hopefully we'll have a lot more of these coming soon in here to give examples of uh, things. And I think they're just nicer than photos. It is. Into the woodland period, last 3,000 years, the environment really is similar to today. Um, <clears throat> culture, however, is changing. The, the big difference we see in uh, woodland culture is pottery. That's what archaeologists use to differentiate the, the time periods. Um, also in the woodland period, we start seeing the development of villages um, and larger scale agriculture, especially in the later woodland period. Um, this isn't a transition that happened like that. Um, kind of the transition from hunting and gathering to uh, farming was 
gradual and one was always supplemented by the other. So Native Americans continued to hunt and gather throughout the woodland period. As time went on, they started to returning to the same kind of plant resources um, and tending them for next year's gathering uh, over a long time that can turn into agriculture when you're starting to select um, specific plants to replant uh, based on the characteristics um, that you want to then reproduce. Um, and again, over time, people start having smaller and smaller ranges, staying in one place for more than um, for most of the year. We start seeing seasonal camps and eventually villages where people are living year round, um, focusing on growing and storing and protecting food. So if, now that you're staying in one place, you need to um, protect food from rodents and, and other pests. Pottery is a great way to do that. <clears throat> Um, around here, the native peoples lived in round wooden structures that are that the Piscataway call longhouses. Um, in some parts of the country, they're called wigwams. This is the uh, this Pig Point River Farm. Pig Point. This is the Pig Point site. This is Barry's reconstruction, and these are some of the artifacts that were found there. Um, we know people are continuing to use the, the kind of the bounty of, of the Chesapeake for food, lots of shellfish, waterfowl, and fish. Um, there's some evidence that, especially in kind of the, the Chesapeake area uh, and a lot of the eastern woodlands, the transition to farming happened kind of later than other parts of the country because there were just so many resources, if you think about the, especially the bay and all the rivers. Um, so they didn't need to necessarily transition to farming as quickly. They were still able to get a lot from hunting and gathering. About a thousand years ago, um, give or take, we start is when we actually start seeing true arrowheads. Um, and that's when the bow and arrow comes to this area. It was in other parts of the country earlier. Um, so, I, and most of you probably know this, but the point I like to give is that um, archaeologists call arrowheads projectile points because really only these small, tiny, triangular ones from the last thousand years or so are true arrowheads. The rest would have been on spears um, or darts. Also, agriculture came um, relatively late. C corns, beans, squash um, is only the last eight or nine hundred years, which is still a long time ago, but um, only the you know one of the last 13 millennia that that Native Americans have been here. Again, the main thing we say is we see is pottery. Um, we see a variety of decoration which can help us date the pottery. Sometimes that can change over time. Uh, sticks, paddles, things that are wrapped with cordage or or rope. Sometimes we'll find net uh, impressed things. So we don't have evidence of things like fishing nets directly, um, but we can find stone weights for fishing nets. We can find nets pressed on, um, on the pottery. A little bit about the Adena culture, which is not my forte, so bear with me. Um, we, in, in some of the sites, at Jug Bay, especially Pig Point, we started seeing uh, Adena influences. Adena is a culture um, that kind of flourished 2,000 to 2,500 years ago in the Ohio River Valley. They're associated with the mound builders of, of the Midwest. Um, it's probably several related groups. They decorated their pottery in a certain way and they had specific styles of projectile points. Um, and specific burial practices that are different from what we had been seeing in uh, Maryland. However, at several sites in Maryland and Delaware and, and others on, you know, on the East Coast, we, we see examples of Adena pottery, Adena projectile points, and sometimes Adena burials, um, including at the Pig Point site at Jug Bay. A lot have been identified on Delaware and the Eastern shore. A few have been identified on the, on the Western shore. Um, and the jury is still out on 
what exactly this all means. Um, large scale travel and trade, big cultural influences. It's it's more than just a few things at some of these sites. Um, so <clears throat> that is a question mark that I think people are still trying to work out. This section goes over examples from Jug Bay. Uh, Jug Bay is in, oh, we, gotta, we have to have a map on here. There we go. Jug Bay is in far Southwest Anne Arundel County and Eastern Prince George's County. Come on map, you can do it. Here it is. Um, it's in present day Lothian along the Patuxent, and it's a hotbed for archaeological sites. There are over 75 sites in the immediate area of Jug Bay on, on both the Anne Arundel and Prince George's sides. Um, and part of that's because it's along the Patuxent, which was a, a major network uh, for for native travel and for, for hunting and gathering. Um, the other cool thing about the Jug Bay area is most of the land's protected and publicly owned. So a, a lot of these archaeological sites have been saved from development because they're in nature preserves, wildlife sanctuaries, or other county and state parks down there, um, which is great because that means that hopefully they're not going anywhere um, and they can be <clears throat> they can be protected for longer. Ooh, I just found a typo. Okay, we're going to fix that later. We still kind of regularly or semi-regularly do work down at uh, in Jug Bay. Um, and we found everything from um, Woodland Period Villages at River Farm and Pig Point. Um, very recently in 2019, we found a, a Clovis Point. So we have evidence of a Paleo-Indian, uh, at least a camp, um, archaic camps. There was a, a port town, actually two, one on each side of the river colonial port towns in the 17th century, um, and then tobacco plantations, steamboat wharves, and a, and a railroad that you can kind of see this, this green in the photo is the old railroad bed. Tenant farms, hunting lodges, and mining. So tons and tons of stuff down there. <laughs> uh, we've worked with Archaeologists from Anne Arundel County, PG County, the Lost Towns Project, the Archaeological Society of Maryland, and the State of Maryland um, worked together in 2019 for a survey of the area, which is where they identified um, more sites that got it up to that 75 number um, and dubbed it the Jug Bay Archaeological Complex. There's a lot of undisturbed stuff there. Um, it's really important for the history of the state, but also I argue the country. And it's a hidden gem. I didn't know about it before I started working for the county. Now I'm not from Maryland originally, um, but I had lived here for a good seven years. I had never heard of it. Um, if you haven't been down there, check it out. They have a lot of nature programs at the at the Jugway Wetland Sanctuary, um, stuff for families. Um, Patuxent River Park is on the PG County side, Mount Calvert. Um, they have a museum there. Cool stuff. So if you're if you're into the outdoors and nature, which I assume actually many of you would be, um, and you haven't been down there, check it out sometime. The water there is tidal um, and it's estuarine, so it's a mixture of salt and fresh. On the eastern side, it's um, Jug Bay Wetland Sanctuary, which is in Anne Arundel County Park, and on the western side is Patuxent River Park. Jug Bay Natural Area, um, which are both PG County um, parks, and Merkel Wildlife Sanctuary, which I believe is state. Until 2019, we didn't have any evidence of the Paleo-Indian period uh, at Jug Bay. We did a field school with Washington College, and I wasn't there for it, and I'm Grouchy, I missed it. Um, I was doing dissertation research abroad. 
and a few paleo artifacts were found, including a Clovis point at the Pindel Bluff site. Um, the Clovis point was found by an intern, and I've I've learned from doing this research that interns find all the cool stuff. It's never the professional archaeologists. The interns are finding all the cool stuff. Um, it was a, um, a young woman whose name is Sarah who picked up the Clovis point and said, what is this, a big flake or something? And after that, she was forever known as Big Flake. I had a volunteer come up to me from v Richmond, Virginia, and he has family up here and he came to visit and, and joined one of our digs. And he said, I heard you guys found a Clovis point, someone named Big Flake. So across state lines, she is known as Big Flake. Poor Sarah. Well, she's found one of only three uh, Clovis points that have been found archaeologically in the county. Um, it's this right here at C. It's short. There are longer ones and shorter ones. This is the shorter variety. Um, what gives it away is the, the rounded shape uh, and fluting, which is this kind of square area uh, on the bottom. And that is a feature that's really only common in Paleo-Indian and early archaic points uh, where uh, you take... Hmm. The way that Zach Singer, my colleague, likes to put it is, over time, people found different ways to attach the rock to the stick. <laughs> um, and at, at one point in these earliest time periods, they created what, what we call a flute, which is this little square rectangular cutout on either side of the point. And then that was theoretically would have been placed kind of in the, the wooden shaft of the spear and then tied around with some, some cordage, some rope. <laughs> but this is a feature we only see kind of early on. Other things that we see um, from the paleo period is um, here, what, what letter A is, is a type of stone called orthocortsite, which is also called silicified sandstone. Uh, and that is a, a type, a material type that we only really see in paleo Indian um, and the earliest of the archaic period. Um, after that, we don't have, we don't see it. Um, really in, in, in Maryland. And so the theory, one of the theories is, and the one that I found most convincing is that wherever that quarry was, the source for orthocortsite is now under the Chesapeake Bay. And so after the bay formed, people could not access that, um, that stone. Um, Zach Singer, who's now with the state, um, was with the county and, and kind of directed a lot of this research. He's a paleo guy, loves the paleo period. He's doing a big survey at the at the state to try to learn more about this earliest um, time in, in Maryland's history. Uh, and we did a bunch of shovel test pits up and down kind of the Pindell Bluff site to see where the different artifact concentrations were. Um, and the orthocort site was in one specific area of the site. So that's where we decided to open up units um, like these two. And that's where the Clovis point was found. It was not found in a stratified um, deposit. So we don't have like other things near it that we know are paleo, um, but we know because it's a Clovis point that it's that it's from the paleo period and from the orthocortsite nearby too. Um, Pinda Bluff is as its name implies atop a bluff and we have lots of erosion happening there from wind and rain. Um, and so we don't have deep stratigraphy there um, deep intact soil layers, the way we do at some other sites, including Pig Point, which I'll talk about shortly. Okay, here we go. So this is Pig Point, and this is textbook stratigraphy soil layers. This is what you learn about in Archaeology 101, and then of course it's never this pretty in the real world. There's always disturbance and, and pits and construction and, and this, um, but at the Pig Point site, which is on private property just north of Jug Bay Wetland Sanctuary, um, we had stratified deposits going back 8,000 years, beautifully dated, we could carbon date them. Um, and again, this is before my time here and I'm still grouchy I missed it because it seemed like a really cool dig. Um, I think some people on this call were on it. <clears throat> this was excavated from 09 to 2014, um, on 10,000 years they, they found going back. Um, Pig Point was a, in the archaic period, a base camp, and then later a village, a large village, and a village that had um, those Adena influences from oh, the Ohio area. Um, that was the, the Pig Point site. 
Um, we found lots of hearths, um, tons of stone flakes, points, pottery. Um, and this is an example for the archaic period. So we talk a little about mortars and pestles. And that work was all directed by Dr. Al Lukenbach, um, the former uh, county archeologist, he's now retired. Shout out to him though. Woodland period um, is when we start seeing villages. So Pig Point becomes, um, is a village site. Sometimes we, we'll see this, we'll see villages that are on locations where people have been coming seasonally for thousands of years. Pig Point was not the only village site. The River Farm site, uh, which is just a few miles downstream, was a smaller village associated with, we think it was associated with Pig Point. Um, they dated to the same time period. Pig Point was much, much larger. At River Farm, we found um, oyster midden. Oyster middens are all over the place uh, along the bay and its tributaries. And oyster middens are um, kind of large piles of oyster shell that are formed when people are bringing oysters somewhere and eating them over uh, long periods of time. And I just saw a great quote by Al Lukenbach that was, well, oysters don't walk, so somebody had to pick it up and carry it here. <laughs> um, they're typically associated with um, feasting, um, but the anthropological version of feasting, which just kind of means eating together over as a culture over a long period of time. Um, we're also finding uh, things that are used to cook and make food, pottery, um, stone tools, bone tools. And at Jug Bay specifically, we have evidence that Native Americans were eating mussels, oysters, turtles, deer, birds, and fish, meaning we're finding those bones or shells associated with cultural material that we can date to this time period. We also found um, post holes, which you see a lot on um, colonial sites and, and post-colonial sites, but are hard to find um, on woodland sites because they're, they're much smaller posts. So um, a post hole is a stain in the ground that is left behind when a wooden post decomposes. So um, in, in colonial and, and 19th century, especially 17th and 18th century, which is more of my specialty, you, you'll see the big wooden posts that maybe a foot, foot and a half um, placed in the ground, post and ground construction. Uh, and then over time that post rots and decomposes, but it leaves behind a dark stain in the soil there. You can't miss them if you've ever been to a dig on a colonial site, um, they're all over the place. Um, and you can play connect the dots and figure out where the nice square building was. Um, it's different obviously, when you're looking at woodland period longhouses, like we have at River Farm and Pig Point. Um, the, the posts that you have aren't really posts so much as they're these kind of beams from the long structural um, boughs of, of trees. So they're, they're only this big around. Um, and so that's gonna be a lot easier to get destroyed, washed away, not noticed. Um, but at River Farm, um, at River Farm we found kind of a a lot of posts in an arc period um, uh, period um, pattern that could have been like a palisade, but looks more just kind of like a boundary um, marker, some sort of kind of edge of of the village, or at least an area of the village. And at Pig Point, we had um, posts that were they're, they're here in the red and green those are two overlapping longhouses so two different periods um there were structures there that people were living in um and that's really cool you can't you you just pig point was a gold mine for archaeology it's so well preserved um and you find things there that you dream about being able to find and i haven't been able to dig there too late came too late I'll go through a little bit of contact period history. And again, the main focus is on the archaeology, um, but I did not want to stop the toolbox at 1600 and pretend that Native people do not continue to exist today uh, in this area, because of course they do. Um, <clears throat> in 1608, John Smith mapped the Chesapeake 
uh, including rivers, major rivers like the Patuxent. Um, and it's one of the earliest, it is the earliest documentation we have of, uh, of a map that shows kind of where um, some villages are. Now, these two villages here, Mattapaniet and Quoctatog, are in the Jug Bay area. Mattapaniet's on the um, Prince George's side and Quoctatog is on the and Arundel side, there's a later map from the 1670s that show two different villages also in the same area. Um, we have not yet found evidence of those villages archeologically. PG County might be though. <laughs> um, late, over the last few years, they've been looking um, over at, and, and they definitely have um, some late woodland stuff uh, coming out at, uh, what is the name of the park? Mount Calvert. Um, and last I heard, they don't have enough evidence to say it's contact period yet, um, but it could be. Um, so we're hoping that we can find these. We They should be there. Um, but notice on this map, nothing really further north. You can, um, we, and we don't, and we don't have archival evidence um, or oral history evidence of, of that really either. Um, Really, you can see the main focus was on in Southern Maryland along the, the bay, but especially in the woodland period along the Patuxent and the Potomac. Um, he also maps Virginia, but boo, we don't need Virginia with the Maryland Natural History Society. Uh, Maryland tribes uh, continue to, to thrive in the state. Um, the Piscataway, who are the um, descendants of, of many of the people who would have been at the sites in Anne Arundel County, are now based in Charles County, but many still do live in Anne Arundel. Um, and there are several communities throughout Southern Maryland. Um, <clears throat> they do some outreach events. We're working with um, uh, a member of the Piscataway County um, to put on some public programs um at jug bay probably well it'll be in the new year um but we're still working on on making that happen um the the collaborative spirit is high right now among both archaeologists and uh, among native communities which is which is wonderful um it hasn't always been that way um archaeologists to put it nicely have not always done right by native american tribes um but i'm very encouraged with some of the conversations i'm seeing between archaeologists and native leaders um, really with the, the spirit of kind of collaboration and reconciliation. I won't go through archaeology 101, but it's here should anyone uh, want to learn about it. But I'll, I guess I'll go through what it says um, just as a teaching tool. We talk about the archaeological process and how it's a, more than just digging. It starts with research and, and background research, excavation, lab work and analysis. And interpretation. Ta -da. Um, and then the end, definitely check out um, the additional resources. I've put links to as many quality things I could find, um, both from archaeologists, historians, native communities. Um, another recent resource that if you haven't seen is, is interesting is the MICE Indigenous Records. It's an online database uh, from the Maryland State Archives where they've compiled um, every document that they have that, that relates to uh, Indigenous history uh, into a searchable database there. Um, and that was also done uh, as a collaboration with some uh, Maryland tribes. We have some curricula on here, especially for the you know teachers and students. Um, links to other tribes, links to uh, archaeology, some videos, including some about Jug Bay. Actually, almost all of these are Jug Bay museum apps. These apps are really cool. Um, these were also all done in in collaboration with various native groups. Um, if you're looking for a book. Um, Indians of Southern Maryland by Roundtree and Sieb is the best I've found um, at attempting to explain the very complex geopolitical situation at the time of European contact. I think a lot of times um, we tend to 
sometimes, I guess, just in school, we tend to think of Native Americans as, as a monolithic group instead of the many different tribes and factions within those tribes um, that that was happening. And when when in the early 1600s, when the English were coming and colonizing Maryland, it was a very complex situation. There were many different groups um, who had uh, alliances with each other at various times. Sometimes they would break, sometimes they would band together. Um, different groups had different reactions to the English coming in. Um, some saw them as a threat, some saw them as a potential ally against other natives. Um, now this is, uh, this is based prime there's some archaeology and oral and oral history she is an anthropologist so she's worked with native tribes in maryland and virginia a lot of it is based on the um the 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 stuff that's in the archives um <clears throat> because that's what we have written down so that's part of the only part of the story but it's what we have um and it's it's a it's good i think it's good it's it's if anything, it really opens your mind to just kind of how complex the situation was in the early 17th century. <clears throat> and a big thank you to these people. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I can take some questions if we have any. And I think it looks like um, looks like Matt's put some stuff in the chat, which is great. Um, oh, I will do a. I'm gonna I'm gonna share what's... your website one more time right now. Um, and there's a question if you scroll up a little bit about okay. baskets. I think I saw you take a picture. I think you can find baskets in certain circumstances. I, we don't have any. Um, you, you can, it's, it's, it is rare. It usually would, would decompose. Um, and I don't know enough about baskets and, and perishables. It's called to, uh, to know what examples we have in Maryland. Um, but I know you can, um, you can find them. My, my colleague Amelia Chisholm, who was with Anne Arundel and then joined the dark side, AKA PG County, um, she was she's a, a grad of Mercyhurst University and they have a big kind of perishables so like leather baskets things like that uh, they have a big program up there um but it is not something I know very much about so I, I we don't have any from these sites that I know of you can in very spectacular circumstances find some of that preserved Denise asks, I'm curious if anything is known about Native Americans on the South River on its southern shore. Uh, yeah, so we do. So there's there are Native sites throughout Maryland. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, yes, but all throughout the county, including along the South River. Um, the focus was on Jug Bay, but uh, also in this specifically just because of where we've done a lot of the work. Um, but our lab is on the South River. It's at historic London town in Edgewater. Um, we know that it in it, the 17th century, we don't have evidence in the Annapolis area, the Edgewater area of, of villages. But before that, we do have, um, I don't think there's any, no, there's no paleo evidence in the kind of the broader Annapolis area, but we know there are archaic camps and there are shell middens. There's ev everywhere, all up and down the bay, up the su up and down the Severn, up and down the South River, there are shell middens. So people were, were camping there, or if they weren't, if they weren't full-fledged villages in the woodland period, um, people were at least seasonally camping there over a long period of time. Um, so yeah, there are several sites along the South River, um, just none that we believe are from contact period. Thanks. Yeah, Jennifer, you want to go ahead? Would Piscataway, New Jersey have derived its name from Maryland Native Americans? Yes. So. Um, the and and Roundtree's book goes into this a little. Um, from my recollection, uh, obviously due to colonial pressures, many Piscataway they were first kind of forced to go down into um, the swamps of Charles County. Um, and there's been some great collaborative research coming out of St. Mary's College 
um, Julie King is the, the archaeologist there, and they've been working with the Piscataway to identify some of these sites. Um, I know they, ap after they kind of moved a little bit south, they were in the Zakaya Swamp area. Some stayed in Charles County, some moved to Virginia for a time and later came back. Some moved up the Potomac for a time and later came back. Some moved up into Pennsylvania and New Jersey um, for a time and some came back. So we see a bit of a scattering. And so that's that's where um, the New Jersey name comes from, as far as I know, is is uh, the, tr the Piscataway tribe is based here, but in many cases, were forced to move other places. What tribes would be located on the Gunpowder River? Um, probably the Susquehannocks, we'd say. North in kind of Baltimore and North. Um, Piscataway weren't real, really up there that much. Um, Susquehannocks. Oh, and there's a really good, um, really good, pretty good anyway. The, the native land map, hang on. Native.land, okay. Um, I put a link. This is a, a good map um, and it's crowdsourced. Uh, and so it, it's, it's, you, it's you, you can add to it. This shows, it's, it's not comprehensive, but this does show kind of traditional areas um, of different tribes. Um, a lot of this, again, is just based on where things were 400 years ago, because that's where we have written records. Um, and again, before that, it gets even um, harder to figure out. The 1652 peace stream between natives and colonial settlers at Providence. Yes, I don't, you know, I don't remember the details of that one. Um, that is probably in Rebecca's seat, Rebecca's book, but it's also probably in Annapolis City on a Severn, which is my go-to by Jay McWilliams, my go-to Annapolis history book. Evidence of warring among the woodland period tribes. Yeah, um, so, and, and a lot of this we have, we have oral history records. Um, the the Piscataway and, and allied Algonquin speakers and the Susquehannocks from Baltimore and, and really from Pennsylvania, um, those were different language families, different cultural affiliations, and they did not get along. Um, and we have oral and written evidence I don't know if we have actual archaeological specific evidence that we can say is, you know, a battle or something like that. Um, but we know from written records, European written records and native oral history, um, that those groups were fighting. The, the, the Susquehannocks were kind of coming, encro encroaching, according to the Piscataway, encroaching on, on their territory and coming down into um, southern Maryland and central Maryland. Uh, and that's one of the theories as to why we don't really have a lot of contact sites in Anne Arundel County um, and, and kind of Baltimore area is because that was sort of a buffer zone um, between the more permanent settlements of the Susquehannocks to the north and the Piscataway to the south. There are a lot of records of interactions with Northern Hurons, Five Nations, New York, any historic writings of Maryland interactions with local tribes? Yeah, so the Susquehannock were allied with, I think they were a part of the, eventually the, the Five Nations um, over the time period. So that you do see a lot in the records um, of the, the Piscataway and other Algonquin groups um, in the South um, complaining about encroachments from the, the Susquehannocks, the Iroquois who are um, affiliated with the Five Nations from the North. Um, yeah, I would check uh, Indians of Southern Maryland book, and I would check that um, Maize Indigenous Records at the Maryland State Archives um, for more information on that. Fish weirs. Uh, yeah, there were fish weirs. I don't know. I, I am. I do not know of fish traps, fish weirs in the county, that doesn't mean we don't have them. It just means I might not know about them yet. <laughs> There's 1,750 sites and I don't know all of them. Um, yeah, we do find that. I don't know if we have it specifically here.
Meredith sends a picture with a stone. Let's see. It look this this looks like a shirt from here. Hard to tell. It's kind of glossy. If it's glossy and smooth, it's probably a shirt. And those are also there's different kinds, and I don't know enough to know where this one's from because that is a specialty that is not mine. Um, Zach Singer could tell you, um, but a lot of them are. We'll get them from Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, surrounding areas, but not the county. The Annapolis history book I mentioned is called. I'll write it here. Yes, thank you, Chris. <laughs> Annapolis City on the Severn by Jane McWilliams is the go-to. It's very well researched. And obviously it does focus more on the European history of Annapolis, but it does talk a little in the beginning about um, native history and colonial and native interactions. It's Jane, J-A-N-E. Although your uh, writing comes out as J, but whoever asked the question is Jane. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought I wrote it. it is, it's Jane McWilliams, J A N E. I think the closed captioning might have translated that as J. So thank you, Chris West. That was helpful. Oh, good luck closed captioning at the Ray Dice talk. <laughs> Um, I'll also put in here my email in case anyone has any other questions. Feel free to reach out. Um, my specialty, believe it or not, is really colonial and post-colonial history, um, but I also do a lot of our public programs, so I was the one who was called on to make this map. So if I don't know the answer to a question about Native archaeology, I do know the people who would. Um, Sean Sharp's my colleague who I ask a lot of questions to and Zach Singer now at the state uh, knows a ton um, about paleo history. So um, if you email me and I don't know or I wasn't able to give a great answer today, if you email me again, I can put you in touch with someone who will. <clears throat> um, also, shameless plug, we do take volunteers. Several of you are on this call. Hi. Um, if you want to, if you're interested in learning more about getting involved in your relatively commutable to the Edgewater area just south of Annapolis. Um, we take volunteers in our archaeology lab. We're currently open Tuesday and Wednesday during the day, Thursday during the day and early evening, uh, and one Saturday a month new this year, which has been real popular. Um, we do take volunteers on excavations too. Those are usually during the week. We don't have any right now. It's winter. And really, this it's been slow because we've had a few big lab projects going on with some donated collections. But if you um, send me an email, I can get you on our mailing list so that if we, when, when, I'm going to say when, when we do go out again in the spring, um, you can you can know and and come along if you want to learn more. And you don't have to be you don't have to dig. All you, all you really need to do is be able to stand and at a screen and sift through artifacts and um, put them in bags. <clears throat> So, are you open this upcoming Wednesday? Good question, but no, because of the Thanksgiving holiday. We're open Tuesday next week, but not Wednesday. Uh, and there, yeah, so you can e you can email the, uh, my email for more info about that. Or if you go to the cultural resources website, which is aacounty.org slash CR, and you maneuver around a little bit, there's info about volunteering, sign up link, um, actually, I can put the sign up link in here. It's going to be there's a direct link to um, the lab sign up. Um, but do email me if you're interested in getting involved or learning more about um, public programs. Speaking of public programs and Jug Bay. Friday, two days from now, we um we are going to be giving a tour at River Farm um at Jug Bay. Um if you're interested in it's it's there's one at 10 a.m. and there's one at 1 p.m. 
Um, if you're interested, send me an email as soon as you can, because we still have spots left and I can give you more details on that. So down in Lothian, Maryland, um, we have one at 10 and one at one. We'll be kind of talking up there. Some of it will be a recap of what I just said, but we'll also be talking about archaeology in general and have some artifacts from River Farm um, and Pendle Bluff, including the Clovis Point. Um, uh, so, yeah, if you haven't, if you... If you'd like to know, um, please send me an email and I'll send you that as soon as I can because there's directions and it's complicated. <laughs> it's behind a locked gate. <clears throat> Another one. Okay, this is... Oh, that's pretty. I can't tell. It looks like quartz. Uh, it looks... Or it could be a flint. It's hard to tell from here, from this view, if, if this smaller, whiter one is a quartz scraper or a like white gun flint. And I just can't tell um, from just that angle. That was awesome, Drew. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invite.